again. Hi there, come on in. Join me for an up-to-date format here on Michigan Outdoors, something we're trying out on this show we're considering moving to in the future. We have a dramatic rescue of white-tailed deer. This took place this past Saturday near Mayo. Uh, Alert Outdoors Club member Terry Gillette captured this footage on his home video recorder. Governor Engler's chief spokesman John Truscott gave us an exclusive interview the day before yesterday about the governor's plans on splitting the DNR, which could have a big impact on the future of hunting and fishing in this state. We'll have a lot more, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost, trying out a modified outdoor news format here on Michigan Outdoors. It's 9.38 a.m. Saturday, May 18, 1991. As we were preparing for a wild game dinner at Papa Bear's in Luzerne, a few miles away, one of the Outdoors Club members who had tickets to the dinner, Terry Gillette from Mayo, was videotaping a dramatic rescue of four white-tailed deer all of them bucks that had become stuck in the mud of the Mayo Pond. One at a time, these bucks were literally pulled from the muck, towed by holding their velvet-covered antlers until they were at a rocky shore. Now, this buck was the first one towed to solid ground, and he taught the rescue party that some of the best laid plans don't work out. As tired as this buck was, it still had the strength to swim the river. It wanted to get away from the people it saw standing along the shore, and off it went, back towards the mud, the very ground that entrapped it in the first place. You can see its antlers. They're developing fairly well. They stand out against the water. This could easily become a big buck by October, that is, if it lives that long. For a moment, it appeared that this buck had found some firm footing. But oh no, now that buck had to head back to the muck that will once again grab it and pull it down where it would die if humans didn't help it out. Now who are the fellows who are rescuing these four bucks? Hunters, of course, members of the Northeast Sportsman's Organization. Hank Needtee is the fellow on the snowshoes. He's also a member of our outdoors club, and he got the idea to run into town to the sporting goods store and purchase a pair of snowshoes right away. He figured it was the only practical way to get out to the deer where he could throw a rope around their heads. Now, he didn't say, or he did say, that he couldn't have gone much farther than this. His snowshoes were starting to sink in. That takes courage right there. Only a half hour has passed since the first buck was unsuccessfully freed from the muck. It's 10.07, and they're working on the other ones in the group. Now, they'll take care of that first buck when they get these other three loose. Pulling the bucks from the mud is one thing, but getting them near the boat when they get one or two legs free is something else. Hank is still okay. That buck is still mired for the count. Many people were lined up on the bridge watching this ordeal. It started at 9.15 a.m. when a motorist called the, or was crossing the Campton Bridge, noticed the deer stuck in the mud and called the sheriff's department. The one officer who responded needed help, so he called conservation officer Cheryl Ball, who was backed up by the Northeast Sportsman's Organization, who they do a lot of work in the Mayo Pond and the area waters. Now, these club members brought boats and they bought snowshoes and, and ropes and worked for two hours to get these deer back on dry land. Now the reason the Mayo Pond is so low right now is Consumers Power is doing some work on their dam and they had to draw the water down to the normal level of the Osabo River. Now that left all this muck exposed because they dropped that level about eight or ten feet. Oh, now right here, things are getting exciting, and frankly, this is an extremely dangerous part of the rescue. Just watch. Yeah. Got the one out. Looks like the other one might be straight down. Okay, okay. Let go. Bath time. Got him. Bath time. Bath time. Holding this buck by the antlers wasn't good enough. It worked the first time, but this buck was in a bigger panic, it seemed. 
Gary Soren of Luzerne somehow caught the buck's flailing legs and hogtied it behind the boat. I don't know how he did it, but it worked. They kept the deer's nose out of the water. Well, actually, the deer did that. I'm, I'm sure its eyes were bulging. It had to be hyperventilating, probably frothing at the mouth the way they do when they're stressed. Now, this is the second buck, and they don't want to make the mistake they made on the first one. The time is 10, 12. These fellows are going to take a few minutes on shore to grab this deer's leg so it doesn't jump back in the water. While they do this, let's look at how they transported the second buck. Now, this happened 30 minutes earlier, moments after the first buck swam back to the muddy shore. This pond is usually 8 to 12 feet deeper than this. Like I said, the deer are used to swimming across, and their feet don't reach down to this muck. But with the water level lower, exposing all this muddy land, the deer are evidently confused and don't realize they can't cross here. Now look at that huge expanse of muck. I'm sure everyone wondered if deer weren't stranded in other areas of the pond, and if they don't go down in the muck at night where nobody would see them struggle. Now these deer were lucky. After a few minutes of grappling and tying and holding the upside down struggling buck, a dangerous act in itself, they had a good enough grip to, to carry that buck up the bank to a strip of grass where they could set it down and very, very carefully let it go. Now this is where you have to realize that Bambi was a story, a fictional story. These deer aren't gentle, especially when they're afraid. Their hooves are sharp, and deer are likely to use them when they feel threatened. We know these bucks are being helped, but they don't know that. Well, we thank Terry Gillette and his sister for shooting this footage, and if the deer had any idea what had just happened, I'm sure they would thank the Northeast Sportsman's Organization, but I doubt if these deer know how lucky they are. Wasn't that dramatic? I tell you, if any of you out there capture footage like this, something unusual, some late breaking news, up to date current events, that's the type of thing we're looking for now on Michigan Outdoors, so be sure to contact us. That's the type of programming that Mort Neff used on his Michigan Outdoors for so many years. Now don't miss our outdoor fair the last weekend in June at Houghton Lake. We'll have a muzzleloader's village living encampment. The Livingston Archers will provide a variety of archery events, so bring your bow. Our shooting shows will feature shotguns, bows and arrows, pistols, and rifles. We'll introduce a new trick shooter who we just booked. Seminars, demonstrations, exhibits, wildlife art, decoys, collectibles. That's our outdoor fair last weekend in June at Houghton Lake. In two weeks, we are going to have a report on what we've learned from our Freedom of Information Act inquiry into the DNR's block permit, crop damage permit, the deer season management. That's in two weeks. Right now, we're preempting this report because of recent rumors. We just heard a couple days ago that the governor had decided that he wasn't going to split the DNR. He was going to come in with an executive order and do something different or keep it together. Charlie Keenan. We've had a little trouble keeping up with whether it's going to be the legislature, the governor, and what they're going to do. The, rumor, the rumors are flying out there rampant, and uh, we want to make sure that, that we get all of our facts straight, whether it's going to be split or whether it's going to stay together as one agency. We don't know. Now, we haven't been able to get the governor on the show yet. I mean, he's hardly been on any television shows, any interviews at all. He's been quoted, though, in the papers uh, saying a lot of things that he... He really didn't say. Well, and some of the things were quoted from back in the campaign anyway. To make a long story short, we got a hold of John Truscott, who's the press secretary of Governor Engler, as a spokesman for the governor, and we talked to him to find out about these rumors. Is the information we're hearing correct? A lot of what they're hearing is incorrect. Uh, they're hearing that we're going to take all these divisions and all these sections of the DNR and ship them off to all these other departments. And that just isn't the case. That's not going to happen. What we want to do is take the, the parts of the DNR to focus on conservation issues, the hunting and fishing issues, and take the environmental issues and put them in, in separate entities, uh, we could say, and allow them to function and concentrate on those issues and, and develop the regulations, the laws, and everything to serve the people better and to basically allow the people to know what to expect from the state and from the DNR, spell out the regulations and let them know what the laws are. As far as uh, hunting and fishing licenses, making sure that the money that goes uh, into those, that, that 
fishermen and sportsmen have to pay uh, for those. Make sure they go back into improving fisheries or improving trails or, or state land, things like that, where it can be appreciated by the people who pay those. And then the people who pay the fines over here for dumping hazardous waste, that goes back into cleanup over here. But let's keep everything focused on where it should be. Okay, so, well, this sounds like what we've been talking about and what sportsmen are looking for. Just a little better identity and definition and insulating the money we're putting in. Sure, and that's something that the governor spoke about quite a bit as a candidate. He went to a number of, of functions that the conservation group sponsored. He was endorsed by the big game hunters, went to a lot of their functions. He went um, and spoke at things all over the state. We were constantly dropping in on, on sportsmen's organizations. And he heard a lot of this all around the state. It's, it's something that uh, he knows is out there. I mean, he's a, a great has a great, great appreciation for the outdoors, um, and a lot of his supporters are people who are involved in the outdoors and conservation, and, and uh, he listens to them a lot. I gotta admit, that those responses by Truscott kind of set me back a little bit. I didn't expect that he would at least present even the image that, that the governor is so in tune with sportsmen. Well, he seems to be listening out there. He wants to come up with his own proposal. He's listening to the legislature, he's listening to the sportsmen, and he's going to develop something that's his package. Well, he has been working on this fairly independently, and that's a subject I had to address with, with John Truscott. I haven't found anybody in the hunting and fishing community who has been called in recently on this. And we have asked, if, you know, can we be involved uh, with the Outdoors Club with 40,000 members? Or, you know, do we count? Should we get paranoid about this? Yet? Absolutely not. Oh. I mean, this is a, we just started meeting with legislators about two or three weeks ago. Um, and we'd kind of like to bring them in first since they'll be the ones involved in, in passing and helping us pass this into law. But uh, we've still got several more weeks to go in this. Um, I just had a contact uh, this morning with our uh, person uh, who is, our staff person who's dealing with us and passed along your name, your number, and I'm sure you'll be contacted. But oh, okay. this, this is something that's going to take some time and um, frankly with, with the budget situation and everything the way it is, um, we can only devote part time to the reorganization. Um, but, but we are working on it and we're calling in people daily and I'm sure you will be contacted. That's good to know because we have our, our opinion surveys from the Outdoors Club members. We have all those letters. We have some things. I was really hoping to get an audience in front of the governor at least once before he makes this decision. It looks like the governor is going to be the one to, uh, to make the decision on that. Well, you know, there is talk that legislature, Dodak and Alley have their bill out there, but it seems to be kind of a horse race. Who's going to do it first? I think the governor's going to beat him to it. You think so? Yes. I saw a report that said that this won't be a legislative process. Governor Engler will do this through executive order. It's possible. Um, it, a lot of times when legislation works through the legislature, it gets caught up in a lot of the politics and the emotion of the moment rather than something that's based solely on its merit. An executive order would allow the governor to put the plan forward and it wouldn't be uh, laid out for the legislator, legislature and each legislator to pick apart and try to put money in or take money out there uh, to basically favor their own district. We want a full comprehensive plan that's best for the whole state of Michigan. Um, and an executive order would put it out there and then allow the legislature the authority that if they didn't like the plan, they could veto it. And then we go back to the drawing board. But it allow us to, to basically take all the concerns that we hear, put it together in a comprehensive package that is not subject to a lot of the political wrangling that goes on mm -hmm. when, a, when a major package like this is working its way through. So it's a lot cleaner. Well, I guess from what Truscott said, you're right. I mean, it sounds like definitely the governor's going to make the moves and he's going to do something to split hunting and fishing from the environment. That's the easiest way. That's, that's the uh, simplest way in the process to make that work. You know, I've been complaining for a long time saying there's politics in the DNR. There's politics there with David Hales and some people have said I've been wrong. Uh, do you think that we should even bother talking about the past few years? I think it's important because th there is a transition there and, and it depends on what happens with the new director and the interim director. That's all going to work in together. Well, good, because I did ask that question of John Truscott. I did hear word also that uh, the governor has not been too pleased with uh, previous DNR director, David Hales feels set up by some of the budget cuts. I mean, there's some mean slashes that were done out there Absolutely. in the hunting and fishing end as well that sportsmen aren't happy with. He made no secret that uh, he didn't feel that David Hales was a, a good director. 
Um, Del Rector, who is now the acting director, he feels very strongly about, um, feels that, that he's an ideal person, really, because he's served in the department for a long time. He can move us forward and keep us going on the right track until we do get a permanent director. We're working on natural resource commissioners right now, hopefully in the next couple weeks. That'll be all finalized, and then we can get a permanent director in there. Um, but sure, a lot of the things that David Hales did were political. A lot of the rumors that he floated uh, were meant to get at the governor, and they weren't necessarily true, but they caused some, some problems, and he got a lot of publicity out of it, which I think was his intent. But that's behind us now, and we're looking forward on what we can do uh, to make the DNR, DNR more responsive to the people. I'm encouraged. Are you encouraged, Charlie? It's, it sounds good. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like Truscott was saying that the governor is so enamored with Del Rector as DNR director that he's going to be a DNR director. No, that's that's not going to happen. There are 13 to 15 candidates, depending on which source you listen to, and we have been assured that Del Rector is not one of those people being considered by the commission. But rumors haven't started flying yet on who will be. He still has to pick the commissioners. The commissioners have to be picked, and then and then the director will be picked by the commission. This is all kind of dull. I mean, for Michigan Outdoors, let's face it, this is dull, this is politics and stuff. But one thing we know, the reason we brought it to you on this program is because it's current, it's hot, and it's gonna happen within the next few weeks. And whatever happens is going to impact hunting and fishing and sportsmen greatly. For years to come. That's right. Now, Charlie, we have a part I happen to know that's one of your favorites, a recipe that you are going to absolutely love. Lois Bone sent us a recipe called Alley Cat Surprise. And, and the surprise is, of course, <laughs> that it uses walleye cheeks. cheeks right. Now, this is the cheek of a walleye. You cut right uh, on the, on the uh, rear side of the gill. There's quite a morsel of meat in there. Cut along to the front, close to the eye, then use your thumbnail. And Peels right peel off. that out, and it leaves the skin right on the fish. And that little scallop there, that little mm -hmm. piece of meat, is the most sweet, tender, tasty piece of meat on a walleye. Looks good. I'm going to go ahead and saute some uh, mushroom and onion and some zucchini that you're going to cut up. And you don't want to cook this thoroughly, you just want to let the color come out of it because you are going to put it into some zucchini boats. And then you're going to um, saute the walleye cheeks with just a little bit of shrimp and that's going to give it just a little bit some different the, flavor. The baby shrimp. Right. It, because those, those cheeks are a lot like scallops. Yes, like a seafood. Yep. Now you could also use these from walleye pike. Sure. They have a different texture and different flavor from the salmon and trout. But, uh, but walleye and northern pike are great this way. I'm just going to add a little bit of garlic powder, and I think they taste great just like that, coming right out of the pan. Oh, just sauteed right. cheese. Right. Super. You're going to add some tomatoes and add your meat to your vegetables, and then just a little mozzarella cheese to stick everything mm -hmm. together. And that's all that goes into these. You know, I bet Lois got this recipe as a seafood recipe with lobster or sure. crab meat. Any shrimp, of that stuff would scallops. adapt. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, of course, you could use bluegill perch, little pieces yeah, of any mild. Yeah, just about anything. Yeah, any mild fish just like that. Just pop these into the oven until the cheese is bubbly and zucchini is crisp. I, th I think over the years I've eaten probably 350 <laughs> recipes on this show. This goes in the top five of the fish recipes. Mm -hmm. Walleye is... cheeks are fantastic. I like walleye cheeks raw, incidentally, with a little soy sauce mm -hmm. on them or just fresh out of the walleye, but this is absolutely wonderful. Not only a good use of zucchini, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but it is fantastic. It is, you know, and if you don't happen to get any walleye cheeks in with the bite, mm -hmm. it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really. Cheese. Just, uh, oh, this is good. Lois <laughs> Bone really knows how to put together. Yeah, she does. She knows her fish. <laughs> Are there shrimp in here, too? Yes. A little shrimps? Yep. Oh. Baby shrimp, mm. yeah. Boy, oh boy, make this with anything. This is great. And people shouldn't throw away those cheeks. Oh, no. Oh, Take I think there's going to be a whole new market. Oh. <laughs> Outstanding. Also, there's got small zucchini, too. I mean, you get some of those that are about the size of a baseball bat. I'm sure they're not, <laughs> I'm sure they're not as good. <laughs> right. Fantastic. I don't care if you don't like zucchini, you don't like seafood, you don't like cheese. Put them all together, and Lois Bone has a real winner. This recipe, along with all of our recipes for May, June, and July, are in... Okay, now we have Dick Peterson on the line from Chief Sports Shop up in Houghton Lake by Prudenville there in East Bay. How are things looking, Dick? Well, they're getting excellent catches of bluegill and walleye right now. Uh, crappies have been fair. Pike have been good, but it's uh, a lot of small ones. But good catches of uh, bluegills and walleye using basically leeches and crawlers. Okay, how big are the bluegill? Oh, a lot of 8 to 10 inches. Hmm. They're, in the spa they're on their beds. So mm-hmm doing quite well. And the walleye are running what? Uh, 
I haven't heard of any big ones yet. Most of them are from 16 to 19 inches. Mm -hmm. You're all good eaters. All good size, right. So it's going to get nothing but better for this weekend, I, I bet. I sure hope so. It should be a good next two weeks. should be good. Okay. We'll talk to you again, Dick. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome, Fred. Goodbye. Well, that's good news there from uh, Houghton Lake. Hello, Harry. Judy. Yes. Fred Trost here. Hi. How's the fishing? Oh, not too bad. Um, on the average, picking up between one and three nice walleye. About, about what size? Probably three pounds on the average. And what are they catching them on? Oh, geez, just about everything. Hmm. Um, everything from crawlers on harnesses to tiny tads. Anybody caught a big muskie yet? We had a 20-pounder brought in opening day. Huh. And we had a 10-pounder brought in last night. Super. Well, it sounds good. Should be a good weekend then. I hope so. Okay, well, thanks, Judy. Thanks for calling. Okay, goodbye. That was Judy from Harry's Place up in Manuskong Bay. It sounds like the fishing is picking up there, especially because they've got more water in the bay. Real hunting outlet. Bill. Yes. Fred Trost here. Well, Fred, how are you? Pretty good. How's the fishing? Fred, the fishing is excellent. Uh, right now, the, uh, the wire pullers are out fishing the... Uh, drifters about 10 to 1. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, and it shouldn't be that way till later on in uh, the season. But for some reason or other, uh, and they're catching them from everything where the reports we're getting back uh, from e-course out into the lake, and they're doing uh, real well in the lake already. Now are they getting those big ones? Uh, no, the fish are uh, running a little smaller in the river this year. Okay, so we're talking walleye that are what? How oh, big? Two, three pounds is a, is a big fish. They're mm -hmm. mostly right around the two pound range, around 18, 19 inches. Anything else shaking down in the Detroit oh, River area? Silver bass are in this river this year like gangbusters, Fred. Hmm. Uh, and they're running big. Oh. Uh, they're, the silver bass are big, and uh, we're catching, still catching, a lot of northern pike in and around. Uh, the east side of Groves Isle. Hmm. And uh, for some reason or other, and don't ask me, I've lived in this town all my natural life, the rock bass, they're catching just uh, an abundance of rock bass. <laughs> hey, thanks for the report, Bill. Okay, Fred, and thank you for calling. Okay, goodbye. That's Bill down there from the Real Hunting Outlet down in the southeast, the Detroit River area. You heard him. Fishing sounds great. In fact, all around the state, the report has been excellent. Get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week.